I think a lot of people feel the problem of decarbonisation is essentially decarbonising electricity supply. But when you look at the numbers, you, you see that industrial and domestic heating, transport, aviation fuel are something like three or four times larger demands of energy compared to electricity. Decarbonising electricity gets you a fifth, maybe a quarter of the way you need to get to. We've then got to push on and decarbonise uh, these other uses of, uh, of energy. And hydrogen has a significant part to play in that. Hello everyone and welcome back to Cyrus One Connects podcast. I'm your host Matt Pullen, EVP, Managing Director Europe at Cyrus One. And joining me for our second episode today is Tom Kingham, Director, Engineering Solutions at Cyrus One, and David Kingham, Executive Vice Chairman at Tokaback Energy. Before you ask, yes, they are related. We have a great episode lined up for you today, focused on a crucial topic, sustainability in the data center industry. As you'll hear, sustainability has become a moving target, and it is vital that data centres are ready to meet the unrelenting challenges the climate crisis poses and work towards a more sustainable future. Let's dive in. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. David Kingham, who is Executive Vice Chairman and Co-Founder of Tokamak Energy. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, David, you're, you're a renowned expert in this field and Tokamak Energy is really at the forefront of fusion power. Perhaps you can explain a little bit about your role at Tokamak and also where Tokamak is driving in terms of this really exciting field. Yes, so fusion is is a sort of elusive goal of mankind, you know, to harness the ultimate energy source of, of the whole universe. Um, but it's potentially uh, harnessable on Earth and could give plentiful clean energy for uh, decades to come, for centuries to come. So we're tackling a very big challenge at Tokamak Energy. We're aiming to develop new devices to harness fusion power uh, and to make it economically affordable. And we're aiming to be able to deliver that power in the late, mid to late 2030s. Um, when we think that the needs of industry, the demands uh, of, of everyone to decarbonize will be very, very great. We'd like to do it sooner, but it is a huge technological challenge and it will take us some time. For the benefit of our listeners, who I'm sure are a bit more technologically savvy than I am, um, <laughs> a simple question, what is fusion power? And indeed, how might that have a material impact on decarbonizing the grid? So fusion power, uh, the, the basic reaction is, is what powers the sun and all the stars. Uh, it's a fusing together of two isotopes of, of hydrogen to destroy mass and, and create a large amount of energy from a very small amount of fuel. Um, the, our company is named after a device called a tokamak, toroidal chamber magnetic field um, invented by Russian scientists uh, over 60 years ago. And it's a, a, the device we're working on is a way of using extremely powerful magnets to compress hot plasma and hold it at high density and temperature for a long time, essentially to recreate the sort of conditions you have in the center of the sun and to fuse the ions, the, the isotopes of hydrogen together to, to create significant amounts of energy. So um, we, we talk a lot to the ARPA-E um, teams in, in the US, um, Advanced Research Projects for Energy, and they have fusion development programs and they describe fusion as potentially having all the benefits of nuclear fission with essentially none of the drawbacks. 
so plentiful fuel, low um, land usage, um, high uptime availability, controllability of the fusion power, uh, but no long-lived radioactive waste and no uh, risk of meltdown. And so the possibility of uh, locating fusion power plants close to major centers of population in the future. That's bewildering, but sounds amazing. But also understand there's, there's other benefits of, of fusion. Uh, medical isotopes, clean heat, so so not just electricity, in other sectors as well. And you 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 touched on it just then, but could you could you expand on that? Renewables are fine for uh, electricity generation, um, unless you want a guaranteed constant source of electricity, in which case renewables typically have to be backed up with uh, well, typically gas generation of electricity. Um, now, fusion has two, two or three main possibilities. One is generation of heat, which is then used to generate constant amounts of electricity. Another is just to use the heat directly for industrial processes in, in these sort of difficult to decarbonize sectors like um, cement, uh, um, petrochemical refining or steel production. And then there's another possibility, which is to use fusion to produce green hydrogen um, in la very large quantities. And then you have uh, an energy source that produces hydrogen, no carbon emissions, a storable source of, uh, of energy, tran transportable source of energy. So many possibilities arise if we can crack the, the essential problem of harnessing fusion power. There's been so much talk about hydrogen really being the fuel that will effectively replace gas and electricity. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Because there's nat naturally amongst laymen, especially myself, you know, this notion that you know, hydrogen is unstable, dangerous, etc. But I think what you're predicting is a future where hydrogen can be harnessed, stored and delivered in, in a way that it isn't a worry, isn't a danger to people. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the challenge we are looking at is, is how um, to produce sufficiently powerful uh, fusion power reactors uh, that it's worthwhile turning the, the using the heat and electricity produced by those devices to, to produce hydrogen. Now that hydrogen could be turned into ammonia or into high, uh, synthetic uh, hydrocarbons to enable storage. I think a lot of people feel that the problem of decarbonization is essentially decarbonizing electricity supply. But when you look at the numbers, you, you see that uh, industrial and domestic heating, transport, aviation fuel are something like three or four times larger demands of energy compared to electricity. Decarbonizing electricity gets you a fifth, maybe a quarter of the way that you need to get to. We've then got to push on and decarbonize uh, these other uses of, uh, uh, of energy. And hydrogen has a significant part to play in that. The challenges of how do you distribute it safely? Well, pet petrol's challenging to distribute safely, but we, we do it all the time. Um, so there's some learning to be done, but it's far from insurmountable. Of course, it all sounds like science fiction, I'm sure, to, to our listeners. So... So, so what are you doing? What needs to happen to make this all a reality? Yes, so the best that's been done so far in, in uh, major government laboratories is about 10 megawatts of fusion for um, a short period of time, um, you know, a second or less. The, the challenge is, is not really with the science, it's with the engineering. And in particular, we need to make very powerful superconducting magnets uh, to enable 
the plasma to be held for long enough at high enough temperature and density. Um, and those superconducting magnets have to be made of a new type of material, a new type of high temperature superconductor. And we are using rare earth barium copper oxide high temperature superconductor because it has astonishingly good properties of extremely high current density at um, relatively high temperatures. So when I say high temperature superconductor, I'm thinking you know, much warmer than absolute zero. <laughs> so still about minus 200 degrees or minus 250 degrees, um, but an achievable engineering achievable temperature. And the idea of using magnets to, to hold the fusion reaction in place uh, is because um, if you have superconducting magnets, you get the magnetic field for free. You don't need to put lots of energy into the magnets to keep them going. Um, not like with copper magnets, uh, copper electromagnets need um, a lot of energy to keep them, keep them going. So we see the future as um, a combination of the latest generation of high temperature superconducting magnets uh, with a particular type of tokamak device called the spherical tokamak. Uh, which is known to be a very efficient way of uh, controlling, confining a plasma. With the European Green Deal, for example, with the European Commission set on seeing data centres climate neutral by, let's say, 2030, um, and Europe indeed climate neutral by 2050, um, do, you, do you see available funding? Do you see general support, whether that be um, whether whether that be political support, support in terms of enabling the local populations to you know understand and embrace what's going on, how, how do you see um, the UK government and indeed the European Commission supporting what you're trying to do? Um, well, let's take UK government first. Um, they they've been uh, funding fusion research in quite a big way for uh, fifty years or more. Um, the UK is home to the world leading fusion research device, the, the JET Tokamak, based just near Oxford, near where we are. Uh, and the government has recently brought through um, new regulation for fusion that will enable rapid development. So it's regulation that's based on proper assessment of the risk of fusion and categorizing it essentially uh, similar to um, petrochemical plants or um, uh, steel works. So he heavy industry, but not nuclear in the sense of nuclear fission. So that uh, that's extremely helpful. Uh, the continued government re uh, research funding is very valuable to us. Um, if we look, look to Europe, there's a major a uh, fusion reactor being built in southern France, the so-called ITER uh, reactor. Now that's a very expensive and rather slow project, but it's very ambitious and we can benefit from the material selection, from the scientific understanding that's gone into that device. But we think the future is much more compact uh, spherical tokamak. Um, if we look at, across the states, um, a lot of growing enthusiasm, as you might expect, a lot more private funding coming into fusion. Um, so uh, instead of a couple of hundred million dollars a year of private funding that's happened over most of the last decade, uh, the funding levels now are running at several billion uh, of new private money per year. So that's really accelerating things. Could you just explain in really simple terms the difference between fission and fusion, just so our listeners understand? Yes, yeah, so um, fusion is the joining together of small um, atomic nuclei to form larger ones and release energy in the process. Now, fission is the opposite. You start with a large um, atomic nucleus like um, uh, uranium, typically, and it splits apart. Um, it, 
in a in a fission reactor and that releases again a large amount of energy but in the case of fission it also produces radioactive byproducts which some of which um, need to be stored for tens of thousands of years or more uh, before they decay to uh, not being radioactive anymore so fission as 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 i said it it's um has essentially fusion has all the advantages of fission with none of the particularly awkward drawbacks but it's very difficult to do so that that's the so fusion is very safe if anything goes at all out of normal with um a fusion reactor the reaction stops there's very little fuel in the device at any one time so it's not a problem um whereas in a fission reactor as we know unfortunately there are bad accident scenarios that could happen i found it fascinating understanding this sort of evolution from nuclear fission to fusion it's it's incredible so just in terms of of timelines around making this a reality the, the beginning we 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 talked about it you touched on the sort of timelines but you know what what's reality here do you think it would be nice to think we could design the fusion power plant of the future today but we have to do quite a bit of learning and technology development before we can finalize that that design so we're anticipating our next major device uh, in 2026 a fusion pilot plant in about 2032 and then um, which is capable of producing energy to the grid but in only in pilot scale quantities and then a fusion power reactor at the sort of 500 megawatt electric output level by 2035 first of a kind by mid uh, next decade and, and if fusion's really the solution how do you see the world sort of bridging between now and then bearing in mind the sustainability targets that we've touched on in our in our chat but also that are out there sort of headlines for the world i mean wind and solar can no doubt do a lot more but they are intermittent en energy sources and so if they if they um you use a huge amount of wind and solar in a to power a grid you need a lot of backup and very difficult to completely decarbonize a, an electricity grid um nuclear fission could contribute more but as we know the time scales for new nuclear fission plants are very very long because of the understandable regulatory environment um so i i think that we'll get to 2030 and, and beyond with a deficit in the carbon reduction um compared to the carbon reduction targets that are being set today i think some some companies will make great strides in decarbonizing uh, but a lot of companies and a lot of countries will just not be able to do enough yeah i, th I think that's the, the the harsh reality um so on on that basis we obviously need a lot more people involved in fusion trying to you know, drive awareness and drive innovation and get to those timelines that you've talked about. So how do people get involved? Uh, well, um, we, we employ about 200 people these days. So there's 200 people very actively involved. Um, we have student placements um, um, and there are other companies around the world who also you know, need to recruit people and and offer placements, training programs, studentships. Uh, in in the UK, we have UK AEA who um, also employ a lot of people, increasing number of people, and uh, uh, have various apprenticeship and and student support programs. Um, 
So I think uh, there are ways into the industry. I think it will become an increasingly important industry. Uh, e even just in the R&D phase, it will be employing many thousands of people in the UK, um, and perhaps larger numbers in the States uh, in, in, in the future. And it, you know, the upside of severe technological challenges is it's really exciting to make progress. Dr. David Kingham, I'm, I'm a little bit speechless. I'm, I'm, I'm sure our listeners will probably replay this episode over and over again because, you know, the reality of, of science fiction coming to bear in a relatively short time frame is so exciting. Um, I know, of course, that maybe the reality is we won't reach some of the climate neutral targets that everyone would like us to see. But, you know, let's hope that as, as, as you say in your LinkedIn page, you know, science, science will save us. And I really hope it does. But thank you for such an amazing insight. And thank you for bringing it down to earth the way that you did. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, pleasure to talk to you. The interesting thing about fusion is that it changes our perception on what is an important energy. That heat can be turned into electricity through a steam turbine. Brilliant, tried and tested. But what if that energy were to be used in, in other ways? Like can it be used to create alternative fuels? And that's where it becomes a little more interesting I think in terms of what we might be doing from a gas generation point of view. So welcome Tom Kingham, um, fantastic to have you in this episode of the podcast. Of course we're reeling from the previous episode when we discussed fusion with David Kingham who happens to be your father of course. Um, the topic was absolutely fascinating, went completely over my head. Um, but nonetheless, it was great to hear about the, the plans for fusion, the benefits, and of course, the misconceptions. But what you're going to do for us today, which the listeners are going to find fascinating, is to really explain how we're going to apply fusion to the data center industry. Um, so the first question I've got for you is, how do you see fusion being utilized by the data center industry? And importantly, within what timeline? I think for, firstly, it's, uh, you, you can imagine how, uh, how excited um, he gets when we, when we have our family get togethers about uh, the future of fusion and uh, keeps reminding me that he's busy pushing back the frontiers. Um, but uh, the key thing for data centers, of course, is that, that we're a, a base load um, consumer of power. So uh, the traditional renewable technologies such as solar and, and wind really don't uh, don't suit our industry particularly well. So in terms of what we can expect from fusion is, is, is this ability to, to create uh, very clean, near limitless um, energy that is, uh, that, that is that is consistent. And we're not relying on, on, on variables to, uh, to get it to our sites. And as the industry continues to, to grow, the demand for power is is becoming incredibly significant. Um, so it, it's a technology that really is very important for our industry. And in terms of timelines, though, when when are we going to see fusion making a big impact on the industry? Given the advances in the various technologies that needed to be invented along the way, like high temperature superconductors and things like that, uh, that we're actually sort of 10 to 15 years away from this being a viable uh, solution. Whether it gets to, to grid scale within that time, I think that's probably more of a political issue than, than perhaps a, a technical one. And, and hopefully that is the case, because if we can, if we can solve the technical problem, then, then the rest will come. So yes, it, it's, it's exciting because um, at, at the moment, as an, as an industry, we are consuming a huge amount of power and no matter how many um, 
renewable type investments we make into buying green power, that there is still that, um, that, that element of carbon that sits within the, within the electrons that come to our sites. Could you just explain what you mean by grid scale? Because um, that's an interesting acronym, but I'm sure it relates to, you know, this, this technology actually becoming readily available through, you know, national infrastructure. By grid scale, I mean um, centralized infrastructure such as power stations. So um, th these schemes that are under construction at the moment, like ITER in the south of France, is a very significant sized power station that, um, that will be replacing what we've conventionally built, i.e. the uh, gas combined cycle um, generation schemes or uh, e even the, the older fission power stations that that, um, that that we have. What becomes really interesting is if it can be made smaller and can it then go into uh, more localized grids. Um, now that might be something that is a development for the future, but for the moment, just getting this thing working and delivering us uh, uh, cleaner electrons is, is the significant part. Tom, I mean, we're talking about 10 or 15 years before uh, the fusion panacea, but obviously that's that's a long time. So the question really is, what are we going to do in the interim? That's a tricky one on the basis that uh, we probably wouldn't be sat here talking about it if, if the answer was fairly obvious. The reality is that the most cost-effective and efficient way for us to get power to a site is by using the, uh, the power utility infrastructure. Um, and on site, we have our insurance policy of the of the diesel generators traditionally. So I think one of the things that uh, we can be looking at is how do we deal with the on site generation side of things? I mean, diesel has been traditionally the fuel. Obviously, that is less desirable to be to be burning too frequently. And and as a result, looking at the hydro treated vegetable oils as a as a drop in replacement for them. Um, but that's very expensive and those generators are not meant to run particularly frequently. I d yeah. And I don't think they've run very well on my chip fat. That's, that's for sure. That, cause that's interesting. There's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that. Um, but also there's been a huge amount of talk around gas and, and I'd just like to understand, I'm sure our listeners would like to understand, you know, why, why is gas better than diesel? Well, gas, uh, uh, you know, on a on a political level, has been designated um, a, as the transition fuel uh, for us to get to this ultimate green position, and and hopefully fusion is our is our answer for that. Um, so natural gas it, it, it burns cleaner than than diesel, so it is a it is a better fuel for us to use. But the reality is, it still has its own fair share of emissions problems. So it it it, it might help us get to where we want to go. Um, but I think what gets interesting is what is the future for, for natural gas? It, what are the drop-in replacements or the equivalent of your chip fat for the, uh, for the gas supplies that go to those generators? Just focusing on some sort of live examples, you know, I know, for example, in, in Dublin, uh, for a few years now, gas generation has been, been a, a factor. Are we going to see a lot more of that? not just because there's a move to green, but because Dublin, as in a number of other major cities with big data center demand, Dublin's going to struggle to effectively provide grid power. And to your point, the local population probably aren't that keen on uh, generation coming through the, uh, the diesel generators on site. So what do you think? Are we going to see a lot of gas generation in Dublin, for example? Well, I think we're going to have to, and it's not going to be just Dublin. They just, um, unfortunately, are probably the first to this position, um, given their fairly early start in the European data centre um, landscape. The bit that um, is concerning is obviously the amount of growth there is in the data centre industry and the, and the requirement for much larger power connection agreements that just are far exceeding the expansion of the infrastructure just to, to provide that power. Infrastructure upgrade projects take five, 10 years to, to realize. And um, 
so we really do have to be looking at on-site generation schemes in order to be able to satisfy the demand that we're seeing from the industry. Is this going the same way as a number of situations within the data center industry, which is that the private sector are going to be effectively funding infrastructure on the basis that you know local and central governments can't move quickly enough to provide the renewables infrastructure that's really needed? Yeah, I think the, the issue in Ireland is, is twofold. Is One is the, uh, the need to upgrade the core infrastructure, the cables to get the power to where it's needed, but also the, um, the offset for the renewables um, generation. Because I think as we spoke about earlier on, the growth in in wind and solar generation is is fantastic and is and is being funded by uh, our, our our green power contracts. It comes with it, its own problem that it doesn't represent a base load uh, generation for places like data centers, where our power consumption is pretty consistent. They don't really help. So by building gas generation schemes on site, we can actually help the utility providers um, with supporting their their ongoing efforts to increase the renewable mix onto the grid. Um, and that is certainly what we're seeing with the with the Dublin situation. But I think it's it's quite important to realize that as a data center industry, we we are prepared to be part of the pro uh, part of the solution, I should say, rather than part of the problem. Um, and th this is a, 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 this is of significant benefit to the grid operators to be able to have dispatchable generation on site, so that the renewables mix can be improved. What's clear is that when you're talking about renewable power in a data center context, you know, data centers are taking power from the grid but it's renewable in the sense that, uh, as you say, through the, through the power contracts, um, money is being channeled into renewable investments that ultimately will change the mix of the power that's effectively distributed through the, the networks. You've used the term stable. You've also used the term dispatchable. So it'd be good, I think, for our listeners to understand those terms in the context of what we're talking about, because of course, data centers rely on you know, stable power. Um, and also the utilities are looking for data centers to provide dispatchable power. The power consumption from the data centers remains pretty constant all the time. It's not something that will go up and down depending on whether the wind is blowing or not. So it, it therefore doesn't tie particularly closely to the, the power that is generated from a wind farm, for example. So yeah, great. When the wind is blowing, those electrons can be, can be far greener uh, to the data center. But when it isn't, then we have to have something that is going to make up the shortfall. Um, and that's really where the dispatchable generation comes in that if the grid is suffering from not having enough renewables on available to it, it's a dark day and the, and the wind isn't blowing, then having a power station uh, equivalent on our, on, our, on our sites that can be effectively switched on to support the grid, that becomes a really useful tool for the um, energy providers to make sure that the security of supply to residential properties and other commercial properties, uh, it's still available. And in terms of the, if that dispatchable generation technology, I think the, the most obvious one at the moment is the gas generation plant, but there are also um, schemes such as uh, using on-site battery storage. The thing is from a data center point of view, you'd have to have a pretty significant sized battery to be able to, to provide enough energy to, to support the data center. Um, simply because of the of the density of power that is consumed by these facilities. Elon Musk comes to mind, of course. Um, there's all sorts of offers we understand from Mr. Musk in terms of providing, you know, batteries to really help support uh, grid power in all sorts of parts of the world. As you say, you need an awful lot of batteries to to provide power. So is that really a 
solution for the data center industry. Well, he, he did the, um, the, the interesting uh, scenario in South Australia where he, where he bet that he could deliver a power system uh, to support their renewables program. I think it was in a hundred days or something uh, crazy like that. Um, so in terms of us being able to deliver something rapidly, yeah, it, it probably is the right sort of technology for us to be looking at. But the scale of it is is a little in excess of what, what might be considered reasonable for a data center. The, the other element is, is it truly green because of the amount of lithium that is being consumed in that? And is that really best suited for a static application? batteries are to a certain degree portable therefore are they not better used for a mobile type application as opposed to a static one but in the interim it may well be a, a very good solution for us to be putting in because it can help with the short-term um, capacity needs so effectively what we're talking about is uh, waiting for fusion and in the meantime really trying to rapidly move away from diesel um, taking away my fish supper by removing my chip fat and putting it into those generators. But in, in reality, moving to on-site gas generation to help support the grid as well, but also thinking about where there is some, a reasonable scale application for batteries. At the end of the day, do you foresee fusion eventually replacing these other energy sources over that 10 to 15 year period? The interesting thing about fusion is that it changes our perception on what is an important energy. Fusion is, is primarily creating a great deal of heat. So that heat can be turned into electricity through a steam turbine. Brilliant, tried and tested. Um, uh, but what if that energy were to be used in, in other ways? Like, can it be used to create alternative fuels from that so can it be used to create hydrogen and and then um, ammonia um, using the, the the heat that is generated by the uh, by the fusion reaction and that's where it becomes a little more interesting i think in terms of what we might be doing from a gas generation point of view because most of the manufacturers of gas engines now are making them hydrogen ready so there is a view, uh, an expectation that at some point in the, in the future, that natural gas infrastructure may well be supplemented or replaced by a hydrogen infrastructure. And therefore, what we want to try and do with our on-site generation is make sure that we're not precluding ourselves from that potential future fuel that, that comes into the mix as well. And I think with all of this, we're not necessarily going to get away from having the need for on-site generation whether it be standby or primary because we are still at the mercy of those overhead power lines that could get hit by lightning strikes or the the underground cables that are subject to upstream switching or necessary maintenance that occurs on the utility infrastructure so we still have to get the right solution in place for on-site anyway it's fascinating the notion that the the gas distribution infrastructure could be used to distribute hydrogen. I mean, that would be amazing. But I guess in the interim, um, and when you start thinking about hydrogen at a local level, aren't there quite a few issues in terms of transporting and storing hydrogen on site, particularly at the scale that would be required for data centers. I mean, I, I, I've heard of companies, innovative companies that are, are looking at converting hydrogen to a gel format and inert format that can easily be transported and stored. But I mean, it sounds fraught with risk and sounds like there's still quite a lot of innovation that needs to occur. The issue with hydrogen is that it does take a lot of energy to create it at the moment. Now, the, the best way for that to happen is by using the excess uh, renewable energy to, to create it in the first place. But hydrogen is a very light gas, so it is quite difficult to contain it because it will find it, even the, sl even the very smallest of holes that perhaps natural gas will, won't be able to work its way out of, hydrogen will. That's where things like 
the work around ammonia becomes interesting. But to create ammonia requires a lot of energy in itself through the Harbour Bosch process. There are a few more things that need to be worked out along the way. And, but the most important thing from our perspective is to make sure we don't miss out on any of those uh, opportunities. So hydrogen is clearly going to play a significant part of this fuel transition to green. But whether it is in hydrogen in its purest form or whether it's gels, as you say, or ammonia, there's a lot of work going on on this front and there's a great deal of investment in it. And, and we'll have to sort of wait and see, I suppose. It's really interesting, all the initiatives that are going on in the industry. Fascinating. Um, and it strikes me that the data center industry is really playing an important role in terms of accelerating the timeline of fusion. Do you believe that? Is that correct? It's more than just uh, the fusion element of it. it it's the it's the renewables agenda in its entirety. We are a substantial consumer of, of electricity. And I think most, if not all of the data center operators are now procuring renewable based uh, power contracts. Um, therefore, they are investing in the renewable developments around the world. So yes, data centers have an, have a, an incredibly important role to play in the developing of future fuels um, and and increasing the renewable mix into, the, into each of the utility grids. What I think is really important for us over the next few years is, is to ensure that we are able to invest a little more in the direct uh, applications of this. So for example, in those on-site gas generation schemes with the view of being able to transition to, to future fuels like hydrogen or, or alternative biodiesels or, or anything that might crop up along those lines. Tom, that's great. So I, you know, it's clear what you're saying is that, you know, while data centers are big consumers of energy, arguably because they are big consumers of energy, they are making a significant contribution towards the acceleration of greener, greener sources of energy and are innovating in particular at a local level to ensure the use of those greener sources of energy in advance of local and national governments being able to deploy uh, grid scale infrastructure. Um, and, and, and that's wonderful to hear, bearing in mind that I think most of our listeners will be concerned that data centers are, are big gray buildings with lots of standby generators and could remain such for the next 10 to 15 years. But in that 10 to 15 years, whilst we're waiting for fusion, it's, it's absolutely clear that innovation is going to occur and data centers are going to continue to get greener. So yeah, when we, when you reference the the data centers being big gray boxes, uh, I think that's that's representative of of where we've come from as an industry. That that really we were quite secretive um, and pr predominantly ran data centers on behalf of big banks or um, insurance companies or manufacturing facilities. As the public, we didn't really know what happened in those buildings and had no real tie to what happened in those buildings. But we're now in the public cloud world where everybody stores everything remotely in, in these um, previously fictitious buildings, but now people are really starting to understand what they are and where they are and what sort of um, impact they're having on their own lives. So, you know, sending a photograph off to be stored in the cloud somewhere does have an energy um, element uh, associated with it because we are using power to be able to store that that image. As it becomes closer to, to each of us as an individual and to, and to you and I, I, I see it now as a, a, as a real responsibility for us as an industry to be better custodians of the land that we build on and the energy that we consume to run these facilities. It's really important that we get that right, that they aren't grey boxes anymore, that they are in fact focused far more on sustainability and um, making sure that we are being responsible with um, emissions on these sites when we have to run generators uh, or we have an on-site generation scheme, how can we make it as clean as possible? Tom, that's an amazing message to, to end on for our listeners. I think they will be really grateful for the insights that you've given, but most of all grateful for the fact that you've taken what 
is really a pretty complicated landscape and made it very easy to digest. Tom Kingham, thank you so much for being part of this episode. Um, I'm sure our listeners will have garnered a great deal from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. A massive thank you to both Tom and David for joining me today and sharing insights on such an important issue for both our industry and the world at large. And a big thank you to you at home for listening to episode two of Cyrus One Connects. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Remember to like, share and comment and tag us at Cyrus One with the hashtag Cyrus One Connects. I've been your host, Matt Pullen. Thanks again and take care.